Hello. Hi. Hey, everybody. It's me. A common thing that comes up as I'm streaming Slate the Spire on my channel is the conversation about AI for games like Slay the Spire and other things like driving cars or whatever, you know, beating Dota, beating chess, beating Go. And it's not a conversation that I hate having uh, at all. It's sort of interesting, and I understand why people are intrigued by the idea of an artificial intelligence tackling Slay the Spire. Um, in fact, some people have put together simplistic AI that attempts to beat Slay the Spire, and um, there have been methods used to beat the game on Ascension Zero with all the characters. Um, not in the way that like Alpha Zero beats the best chess grandmasters in the world, but like people have tried out teaching an AI to play Ironclad by picking certain attacks and then prioritizing playing cards in a certain order. And, you know, eventually you'll get lucky enough that a run operating under that rule set will win. But generally when people are bringing up AI for Slay the Spire, um, they're more thinking, like, how could we train an AI that could be insightful even for someone as good at the game as Jorbs? Or insightful for someone who wants to learn from Jorbs in a way where, like, they can have the AI in their pocket, like they can get... Uh, a world-class Slay the Spire's brain into a computer program which they can ask questions whenever they want. Um, this has been done before very um, big data. This has been done before in a way which utilized big data on a site called Spire Logs, and I invite you to check out my video about the problem with Spire Logs, but like, there are issues with that which lead to the conclusion not being very useful. And it has not really been done in a way that starts from zero and then builds information using artificial intelligence, which I think is what people are excited by because they see AI beating humans at chess and Go and Dota and stuff like this. Although the AI's success at Dota was short-lived as humans learned how to exploit it because it didn't actually understand the game very well. So, anyway, that's all cool, and I'm not going to get all the way into that conversation right now, but what I do want to do is address something that comes up often in these conversations, which is the idea that Slay the Spire is, like, a fairly simple game. Like, if AI can solve Go, then Slay the Spire should be pretty easy. And this is something that's said quite dismissively fairly often. <laughs> when conversations like this come up. Um, often, but not always, by the person who's thinking about tackling the problem. So um, I'm hoping that this video can be a sufficient cautionary tale, I guess, for people who are finding out about AI and think, oh, like a nice a nice uh, hobby project could be to, to beat Slay the Spire with an AI and, and really build something that was really good at the game. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you'll see. And I'm going to... Okay, so the, the problem with answering a question like that on stream is that it's basically asking me to list a ton of shit. Like, in order to express how complicated Slay the Spire is, I have to be able to tell you all the shit in Slay the Spire, which is just a lot of stuff. So I wanted to sit down and actually make a spreadsheet and do a... I'm sure I'm missing stuff, but do like a half-decent job of getting a good chunk of the stuff for you to see. And in order to motivate what I'm doing, I wanted to give you an example from chess, the Forsyth Edwards notation, or a Fen notation. Um, this is a, an extremely useful tool in chess, which has been around since, I believe, the late 19th century. I've done a little bit of work academically with um, chess engines and studying how humans make mistakes in chess in particular with the aid of computer analysis. And... The paper that I wrote, it was just for a class, it's not like a published paper, I'm not that fancy. But what I was basically able to demonstrate was that even though the computers were incredibly good at chess, they still weren't able to understand like the shortfallings of the human players, so they still weren't even... Anyway, this is a tangent. Um, 
basically i was able to show that humans who were fairly good at chess were regularly making moves which the engines thought were mistakes but in certain situations where the moves were like simplifying the position against a tougher opponent for example they were not suffering for making those mistakes um I'm very much about like taking the idea of AI analysis of things and saying like, hey, this isn't actually as good as people say it is, or as simple. That's a that's a thing that I like to do in the world. Um, but yeah, I used um, Fen notation all the time for this project where I was basically interfacing with a chess engine that was better than any human player, and I was just giving it lots and lots of Fen notations and comparing what it thought the best moves in the position were to the moves that humans actually played and just looking for anomalies and patterns and stuff in how that all worked. Uh, you can read all of the Fen notation stuff here and maybe you already have, but the, the important succulent thing is the, the actual string, which is down here. And this tells us that um, there's a row of the board, a rank of the board, a row of the board with a rook, knight, bishop, queen, king, bishop, knight, rook, and then there are eight pawns, and then there are eight empty spaces, eight empty spaces, eight empty spaces, eight empty spaces, and then we get pawns and rook, knight, bishop, queen, king, bishop, knight, rook. And you can see that these ones are uppercase versus lowercase to distinguish uh, which side. Um, this is information about who's to move. This is information about whether kings can castle on different sides of the board. This is information about the 50 move rule, which says that a game is drawn if a pawn move or capture has not occurred in the last 50 moves. And this is just information about the, the move of the game, which I don't believe is actually necessary. I, I, I'm not sure why that's in the fan notation because I don't believe it actually changes anything. But, you know, maybe it's useful to know. And that's what a fan notation looks like. This is where the starting position in chess, but if you're playing a mid-game position in chess, the fan notation will not actually look much more complicated than this. Um, it's not going to get, like, dramatically longer or anything like that. These parts of the board, which are easily summarized as eight empty spaces right now, will get a little bit more complicated. But for the most part, this is basically what a fan notation is going to look like, except the pieces will get a bit more mixed up. So I wanted to try to give you an idea of what it would be like to build a notation for a position in a run of Slay the Spire. So you could see what sorts of levels of complexity are going on in a run of Slay the Spire compared to a game of chess, just to get an idea. And rather than get into a really complex situation toward the end of a run, where like Slay the Spy runs can completely balloon out of control, right? I just wanted to show you um, floor one, a jawworm fight with the Ironclad starter deck. <laughs> I, I didn't want to get out of control. <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, so I started off by looking at all the stuff that we have to understand outside the fight and actually analyze this, like imagining that we were at the whale bonus, although I didn't have us have a whale bonus. And there are some things I left out, like I don't have us specifying what difficulty the game is on, for example. But anyway, the first thing we need to do is track our deck, um, which has an Ascender's Bane, and I'm just realizing that I left Ascender's Bane off of these three and then started recording it down here. Anyway, you can imagine that there's an Ascender's Bane here as well, or maybe you're at low difficulty and you don't even have it. Whatever. Um, one of the nice things about Fen Notation in chess is that there just aren't that many different values that you can have in Fen Notation. Like this, th these are all the values that you can have. R, N, B, Q, K, P, lowercase and uppercase, and numbers for empty squares. Not very many different values. In Slay the Spire, there are 377 different cards. <laughs> so, so, interesting. Also, you can have any number of those cards in your deck. You could have zero, or you could have 3,672. If you got some sort of like double nightmare thing going on, like I have a run on YouTube where I made a gazillion trillion adrenalines and catalysts uh, and overflowed the poison um, counter for the game and actually broke the rules engine. Um, 
I could have gone arbitrarily large with that and actually made millions of those cards. Um, so you have to have some way to communicate which cards you have and how many of them you have. So for that, for the Iron Class Starter deck, I just said Strike 5, Defend 4, Bash. So Strike 5 just means that I have 5 strikes. That's what I did. Also worth noting that you can upgrade these cards. Searing Blow can be upgraded multiple times, so you're going to have to consider some way to notate that. Maybe you just say strike five, strike plus one, or something like that to show that you've upgraded a strike. I don't know. Whatever. You can do something. Okay, so that's our deck tracking. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff going on here, too. In fact, um, let me... I should have done this earlier, I guess, but let me just show you a screenshot of what's going on. That might be nice, right? That's really not fitting. <laughs> Let me do another window capture and show you a screenshot of what is going on. How about that? This uh, run is called This Deck is Too Interesting, Ascension 20 Ironclad Run. This one's from a while ago, but it was the one that popped up when I just Googled for Ascension 20 Ironclad. Look, it's like super past jorps. Hey, we're actually like dressed sort of similar. Although, different headphones, for sure. Anyway, who knows? I sort of always dress this way, I guess. Um, so, just looking at the stuff that's going on here, a uh, next thing to consider is like all the stuff on that top bar we're going to have to do. We're going to have to think about the floor and the map. Basically, we're just looking at the top of the screen. We're not looking at the bottom two-thirds of the screen yet, because that's the stuff that's happening inside the fight. But we're looking at the top two-thirds of the screen. Top one-third of the screen. So, potion tracking we're going to have to do. We can have between two and five potion slots, depending on difficulty and whether we have potion belt and stuff like that. And they can be filled with 42 different potions. So, again, 12 chess pieces, 42 different potions. 64 squares of the chessboard, um, which is like sort of the biggest number that you can get out of chess when you're looking for complexity in chess. So yeah, that's cool. For for right now, that's just empty slot. Empty slot is how I decided to designate it. And then we have relic tracking. There are 178 different relics in the game which can be collected. Um, keep in mind that if you're building an AI, it not only has to be able to track all of this stuff, it also has to like understand the rules of what they do. Um, whether you tell it the rules directly or you leave it to intuit them over time somehow it is going to have to work out like okay what exactly is kunai doing <laughs> which requires it understanding what is dexterity and what is attacks and what is a turn and yeah a lot of rules in slow the spire but anyway there are 178 different relics which can be collected for right now all we've got is burning blood so that's nice so we just say burning blood that, that's all i did there but obviously this is going to end up being like some big array which ends up being like 30 entries long and may need to collect information about the relics so like tiny chest is going to have a number on it and chaku is going to have a number on it etc 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 right but right now just burning blood cool gold tracking uh we can have zero or more gold right now we have 99 great um but that number could be like anything. <laughs> so an AI is going to have to understand, like, what does it mean to have 300 gold versus 50 gold? Very hard to work out what that means. Lots of different things that it means. In fact, spawn conditions for events change depending on how much gold you have. Um, definitely the value of gold is different. Going from 100 to 200 gold has a different value compared to going from 200 to 300 gold and how that value changes depending on your situation in the run. How much card remove costs changes. Ooh, I forgot to record that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's fine. We don't have any. We don't have everything here. We don't have everything. Um, so that's gold tracking. There's event tracking too. There are 51 events in the game, and these events occur at most once per act. So we're gonna have to track. Well, we're gonna have to understand what act we're in, which I assume we're going to be able to work out just from the floor tracking, which I have later. Uh, but we're going to have to track within that act which events we've already had uh, so that we know that those can't happen again. There are also four events. Is um, There's 
variation within events in what exactly they do. For example, the falling event is going to choose an attack power and skill from your deck that you can remove, which means that the value of the falling event is going to change depending on which attack skills and powers you have in your deck. Which might sound like, like, like a small thing to you, <laughs> but if you have a deck of like 35 cards, that means that your AI is going to have to consider... Well, what's 35 choose 3? That's, you know, I guess there are going to be multiples. So maybe it's more fair to say like 25 choose 3. But basically your AI is going to have to consider thousands of different possible falling events if you have a moderate sized deck of Slay the Spire cards. So, uh, yeah, when you're considering whether to go to that question mark or that holy fight, your falling event is pretty complicated in that uh, navigational decision, for sure. And of course, your AI is going to be playing a different deck from any deck that it's ever played before. Um, so, it's not going to like have the ability to just very easily draw on past experience when working out this falling node, because its deck is going to be better than any deck it's ever played before. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that's problematic, but... <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. There's health tracking. So currently we have 68 out of 75 HP. That's pretty clean. If we go to zero, we die, unless we have Fairy in a Bottle or Lizard Tail, but, you know, presumably your AI will just work that out somehow. Um, there's floor tracking. We are at a certain floor. There are 57 floors total. Currently, I said we are at zero, although once we get to the jaw room five, we're actually at one. Um, that's sort of important. Maybe you could leave that out um, or just include it in map tracking, which is the next thing, and which is perhaps the messiest thing so far. You have to understand how the map is laid out to understand which nodes you can go to in the future. If you're playing an act where you could fight five elites, your decision making is going to be very different from if you're playing an act where you can fight two elites just because those are different things <laughs> like like by a lot um that changes like in particular if you're being offered something like an iron wave um i don't know why i picked iron wave but generally if you're being offered some sort of card that is solid value and helps you to kill act one elites you're much more inclined to take a card like that if there are lots of Act 1 elites that you can kill because then you you know, you know get more relics and you make up for the fact that you have this pretty mediocre card in your deck by having a bunch of relics as you go into Act 2. So, yeah. But you're going to have to have some way to communicate the entire map array, which is not that easy. I have actually sat down and tried to... Um, programmatically generate map arrays before and I mean it's not like impossible by any obviously the devs had to do it for the game to work <laughs> so so it's not like it's impossible but it's substantial it's like a bit of work for sure and then you know once you've worked out how to teach an AI what that is to begin with um, or the AI has learned what it is on its own you also have to then impute into that a tremendous amount of logic about what correct navigation through that structure is, which is a whole nother thing. Uh, there's event node tracking. So question marks on the map have differing chances of being fights, shops, and treasures, depending on what's gone on so far in previous events in the act. Um, as we start, 10% fight chance, 3% shop chance, 2% treasure chance. As time progresses, that's going to change. I didn't include any um, correlated RNG in this, but the game is seeded in a way where it uses RNG elements that are seeded by the same number to work out different things. And depending on how you're building your AI, it might take advantage of that or might not. Um, which is really an interesting thing to think about, I feel. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, 
basically that. Okay, so anyway, you can Google correlated randomness in Slay the Spire if you want to read uh, entire posts about all that stuff. Um, it's something that I think about a little bit in my runs, but I generally tend to try to ignore it because it just makes the game less fun. Anyway, potion chance tracking is next. Um, you start with a 40% chance of dropping potions in fights at the start of each act, and then it goes up by 10% if you don't get a potion, and goes down by 10% if you do get a potion. So, as we go into the Jawworm fight, we're at 40% potion chance. This is a very significant number to be tracking. Um, it has large effects on whether you want to use potions in fights or not. If you're at like 70% potion chance, you're much more likely to want to use a potion if you have a full potion belt than if you're at 20% potion chance. Like, you just need much less value on the potion because you're much more likely to be given a new one. There's enemy tracking as well. So fighting enemies changes which enemies you can fight next. There are a few ways that that happens. Um, you can't fight the last elite that you fought. So if I just fought Gremlin up, my next elite's going to be Sentries or Lagavulin. There are three easy pool fights first in Act 1, although there are only two easy pool fights first in Act 2 and 3. We're talking about hallway fights. And after that, you draw fights from a harder pool of enemies. So right now I just said three easy pools, no elite, as my way of communicating that. But that's going to get like a little bit more complicated. If you've fought particular hallway fights, you're going to have to like track them to understand that you can't fight them anymore. I guess you don't have to track this stuff. I guess that's a thing to consider. You could maybe build an AI that just didn't consider some of these things, but like I'm considering them, right? So if you're going to try to build an AI that's better at the game than me, um, if you're starting off by discarding information that I use and benefit from, like that's not a great like first step forward, right? So I'm assuming that you're going to want to utilize all of this information as somebody who benefits from utilizing all of it myself. Also, as we get into this, like, I feel like it starts to perhaps become obvious to someone who like watches on YouTube and gets frustrated that I'm constantly opening my draw pile and looking at the map and stuff, why I'm doing that. Because, like, <laughs> you know how like chess grandmasters can think about the, the board without looking at it and it's like very impressive to people? We're like already like an order of magnitude more complicated than a chessboard and we didn't get up to the fight yet, I want to say. So, like, yeah, I, I do need to, for the most part, look at what's going on, unfortunately. Um, I, can, I can keep in mind a lot of what is going on in my run in my head, but, um, you know, sometimes it is a bit easier to, to look at the board, so to speak. There's also rare chance tracking, so your chance of getting a rare card goes up as you see more common cards. You start off with a minus 2% chance of getting a rare, and it goes up by 1% every time you're offered a common in a card reward screen. This is another thing that's quite important to track. It like fairly drastically changes the value of going to fights versus question marks uh, later on in the act quite regularly, for example. And I mean, for my precursory look at what things are like on floor zero or floor one, that was all I got for like the strategic layer or whatever. Um, I feel like people often split up what's going on in navigating through the game versus what's going on within the fight that you're actually playing against an enemy. Um, if anything, I would say that Slay the Spire players, like casual Slay the Spire players, drastically overestimate the importance of all of the stuff we just talked about and drastically underestimate the importance of actually playing the fight against the enemy correctly. Um, because the fight against the enemy is actually... I... Uh, well... I think it's actually probably less complex than this, but... It's much more relevant, a lot of the complexity. Anyway, we'll maybe get into that a little bit later, but you know, for, for now, let's just go to our fight. So first off, we have to work out which enemy we're fighting. In chess, there are 12 pieces. In Slay the Spire, there are 54 non-boss enemies and then 10 boss enemies. Plus adds, I guess. Anyway, um, 
But yeah, 54 non-boss enemies. We're fighting a Jawworm. So we just say Jawworm. Cool. Easy. We have to know what stats it has, HP, debuffs, buffs, block, etc. I didn't bother to count how many buffs and debuffs there are in this game. Because it's like a lot. <laughs> You know those like late game fights where like your buff bar is actually touching the heart's buff bar like yeah, There's so much stuff <laughs> But you know for right now, it's not that hard It has one vulnerable I'm gonna say because I didn't drop us into literally turn one I I looked at the situation after we'd played one turn and it's been hit by a bash So it's at eight less health than it started on and it has one vulnerable left over from being hit by the bash last turn cool uh, we have to know what stats we have. So, oh, I said no buffs for it and one vulnerable. And then the player doesn't have any buffs or debuffs at the moment. Cool. Although not always going to be true. <laughs> Usually not going to be true. Usually going to get quite complicated. We have to know what attack the enemy is using and which attacks it has previously used if that could change its future AI, which is pretty normal. It's pretty normal for an enemy to like alternate attacks or have three attacks it can choose between and it can't do the same one twice in a row or have attacks that change based on something else that is going on or have attacks that it has to use turn one but different attacks that it can't use until turn three and like <laughs> uh there's there's a good amount of complexity here, and there are like uh, 150 different attacks that enemies can use in the game. Maybe I didn't actually count them exactly, but there are lots of attacks. So here I just said that Jawworm was using Thrash, which is one of its attacks. Um, your AI is going to have to understand what that is in some way. Um, yep, good luck. You know, it's not impossible for an AI to do this stuff, for what it's worth. I'm just trying to give you an impression of what the complexity that you're grappling with is compared to like what things we've seen AI succeed at before. Just so you know what your like hobbyist project is going to be like. And keep in mind that the AI we've seen succeed at like chess and shit has been built like painstakingly over decades. So so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you'll knock it out of the park. We have to know where our cards are. So we have a deck of 11 cards. They can be in our draw pile, hand, exhaust pile, and discard pile. These are the places that they can be. Um, I guess they can sort of be in the process of being played. But I think that only matters for bugs. So if we say that your AI isn't going to use bugs, uh, we don't have to worry about that. Um, probably. So he already said that I have strike, defend, three defend, strike, three defense, and a sender's bane in my hand, and I have a strike in my draw pile, I have nothing in my exhaust pile, and I have a bash, three strikes, and a defend in my discard pile. So that's fairly straightforward for a situation of this complexity. I mean, it's a bit of writing. It's sort of comparable to that Fen string that we were looking at for chess. Like, just this thing by itself is sort of... For the starter deck, it's <laughs> comparable to the Fen string. It'll get out of hand pretty quickly as the deck gets more complex. We have to know how much energy does the player have left. We have three energy at the start of this turn, I said. We have to know if there's any changing information on our relics that needs to be tracked. Perhaps this should could just be managed by your um, by your thing on the strategic layer that was already tracking relics. Perhaps that's a better way to do it. In fact, perhaps relics should be tracked in combat instead of on the strategic layer. Really, the combat versus strategic layer distinction is a heuristic that players use because it makes it easier, but in terms of the actual structure of the game, it's fake. Like They're both just different parts of the game, which is one game, so there's no actual real distinction between the two things, and something that affects one will affect others. But anyway, no relic changing info, and uh, that's all that I really got to. I mean, so all, all I got to was that for turn two of the Jawworm fight with the Ironclad starter deck. Um, which is like you know, 
I mean, you can you can see it all in one screen, which is good. Here's a comparison of it to the Fen string. Um, those are different sizes, I would say. A thing that I like purposefully did though to not exhaust myself was like, well, I didn't actually write out what this map array was. The map array itself is going to look like something of comparable complexity to a Fen string, probably. Um, and I used a floor one situation. In chess, stuff doesn't get more complicated in terms of Fen strings as time goes on, really. Like, the complexity of a fence string is about the same in the mid and late game as it is to the early game. In Slay the Spire, that's not true at all. Um, the nature of a Slay the Spire run becomes multiplic multiplicatively more complex as the run goes on, and you pick up more relics, which interact with more cards, which interact with more potions. Um, yeah, so... You know, if I tried to do this on a floor 50 situation, I just sort of figured that I would get exhausted and want to stop recording the video, so I didn't do that. A um, couple of other considerations, just like fun food for thought. Uh, so the Spire is a like card game, right, with shuffling and stuff, and the shuffle order of the entire deck matters here. Uh, because you're going to draw it all in a lot of fights, right? If you get up to a deck of 60 cards, there are about as many ways to shuffle a deck of 60 cards as there are atoms in the observable universe. So that may be a computational limit for you. Um, if your AI is trying to understand the merits of different possible shuffle orders, it's clearly not going to be able to um, delve into every single one of them individually given, well, unless you make it out of the entire universe or something, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there, there's a very, very, very large amount of complexity there. And you might think like, okay, but like I don't usually make 60 card decks, which is fine. I think like the number of ways to shuffle a deck of 30 cards only has like 20 zeros on it or something. Oh, 32. Well, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> but, but another thing to consider is that the way that events and enemies and relics are presented is basically that you have a deck of them and you draw a card off the top in this game. So like those 174 relics or whatever I said there were. It's like the wrong number, 178 different relics, but some of these are like event relics and store relics and stuff like that, so they're in different decks. Really, the relics are working by having a shop relic deck, a common relic deck, an uncommon relic deck, and a rare relic deck, and then you choose which one to draw from. Um, but yeah, like if you consider that like one shuffle order of the common relic deck could make one play correct, while another shuffle order could make a different play correct, and like, you have to at that point recognize, oh, there are a lot of ways to shuffle that deck, and I have to, like, consider all of them. Or I don't have to consider all of them. Your AI is clearly not going to consider all of them. I, as a player, do not consider all of them because there's way too many, but there are that many of them. Um, so when you're t talking about the realistic complexity of Slay the Spire, you have to consider that. So when people ask me, like, how hard different games are like is this game harder than that game or how complicated different games are is this game more complicated than that game my general response for the last like many years of my life since i became a successful professional strategy gamer is like pretty much every strategy game that anyone plays is arbitrarily complex and arbitrarily hard um insofar as if there's a strategy game which people are playing where every, where people are actually grasping every complexity in it and people are actually making the correct play pretty much every time, like people stop playing it. <laughs> um, there isn't a competitive Connect4 scene or a competitive Tic-Tac-Toe scene. Um, 
drafts is like similar right i think drafts is like sort of the most complex game that humans have gotten to a point where they're playing pretty much perfectly at the highest level maybe limit poker is the same i don't know like we're starting to get to a point where like the simplest iterations of some of these strategy games are approachable to human players in a way where they do stop being meaningfully complex and meaningfully hard but if you're talking about chess the best chess player in the world is rated below 2900 and the computers that are playing chess are rated like 3800 which means that there's no expectation that the human player will ever do so much as draw against the computers basically um so humans are not anywhere near playing chess right and chess is that complicated <laughs> it's, it's like so the spire is a lot more complicated okay like a lot more complicated like like way 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 more complicated and the crazy thing about chess is like a lot of people look at chess and they say, well, didn't AI solve chess? So we could solve Slay the Spire and you could just ask a computer what the right move was. And the answer is no. AI hasn't solved chess. Like every year we build better AI, well, not every single year, but every now and then we have a new iteration of AI for chess. Someone puts more computing power into it. Someone spends time writing code in a new way that's a little bit more efficient or something like that. And that new AI that we build beats the old AI. <laughs> So like five years ago, people were like, yeah, like chess has been solved. Just look at how this AI plays and you can always see what the right move was. But that AI from five years ago, that gets absolutely demolished by the best AI now. So if you were treating it like it was telling you the right move, well, it wasn't. <laughs> it, was, it was telling you a move way better than the ones you would have made um, for reasons that it understood in ways that you couldn't even fathom in terms of your ability to calculate in that game but its moves were still wrong and as we built better ai they were able to demonstrate that by beating it repeatedly so yeah yeah that's what you're you're staring down if you're going to attempt to make something first that can play slay the spire at a level approaching what a good human player can achieve um and then if you want to get it past that point so that good human players can meaningfully learn from it. And then if you want to claim that you've actually solved the game, um, which you're not going to do. You just... We run into the issues with the number of atoms in the observable universe. If you want to solve Slay the Spire, you're just not going to achieve that. So, but that's cool. That's why strategy games are fun, basically. Because humans can approach strategy games by seeing patterns and testing hypotheses and generating heuristics for them and learning rules and techniques and archetypes and strategies and some of these heuristics i think are very useful in strategy games and some of them i think are like limiting and I think that the way that you see humans approach strategy games reflects on how we approach life in a lot of ways. Life is also arbitrarily complex and arbitrarily hard. You're never going to make the right decision in life. You're never going to understand everything about life. But you can use the same tool sets you use in strategy games to make your decisions about, like, do I want to move to that city or stay here? Do I want to get married and have kids? Or do I want to focus on my career? Lots of very hard choices in life um and so something that i like to do as i think about strategy games is think about what patterns of thought and recognition and practice and hypotheses and what have you am i using as a human that are rewarding for me are which ones are making me better at the game? Which ones are unlocking my highest possible potential? Which ones are forcing me to constantly challenge myself and get better and find better answers? And also to pay attention to which ones are like, I don't know if this is exactly the right word, but maybe lazy. Which ones are like quick fixes? Like, 
if I try to build a Noxious Fumes plus block deck, that can win the run for me on silent enough of the time. But then I never challenge myself to do anything better, and I just like settle for that that archetypal solution or what have you. And understanding how I approach strategy games in that way informs a lot about how I approach life and how I try to make good decisions in life. And that's just a cool thing that humans can do. And like, oh my god, if I can make a video this long about how complex and unapproachable Slay the Spire is for AI, like, you don't even want to know what I think about, like, driving fucking cars. <laughs> or, or making judgments about how society should be structured, or, like... I think we've, we've got a long way to go, basically. Not that we're doing it great, I just don't think the AI is doing it great either. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Managed to uh, make a very long list for you and then hopefully give you some interesting observations to think about at the end. And yeah, I'll see you next time.